Fostering Harmony. Pope Francis meets with Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, encouraging interreligious cooperation. An embarrassment. Criticism of the hacking of America's most sensitive and secret communications. Terror victims remembered. Israel holds funerals for Jewish victims of the terror in Paris. And staying home for school. We visit a homeschool family to explore the growing trend in education. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, January 13th, 2015. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. Pope Francis arrives in Colombo, Sri Lanka, beginning a two-day visit before going on to the Philippines. This marks the first papal visit to Sri Lanka in two decades. The Holy Father was welcomed with a rather unusual airport arrival ceremony. A young elephant in traditional garb saluting Pope Francis with its trunk. At the ceremony, Francis talked about Sri Lanka's efforts to reconcile after years of civil strife. We are continuing to follow the Holy Father's message of embracing compassion. Sri Lanka is the first leg of a week-long trip to Asia that also includes the Philippines. Today, the Pope met with leaders of different faith groups, including Buddhist monks. His message of interreligious and ethnic harmony comes just days after that country's election of a new president. After meeting with the Pope, a member of the Sri Lankan parliament tells us religious cooperation is vital for solving many problems. Pope Francis setting a tone of cooperation through his meeting there today. A Sri Lankan cardinal tells EWTN News Nightly he is grateful the Holy Father made the trip to his country. Cardinal Malcolm Ranjith was among those on the tarmac welcoming Francis today. He says the Pope's message to interreligious groups is important for Christians in Sri Lanka. Less than 10% of that population is Catholic. He says it's critical the church works with different faith groups. He also talked about the wide appeal of Francis in his country. Our people uh, are so fond of him and uh, across the religious differences. And um, we could see that in the way they received him and the way they waited and cheered at, at him uh, all along the 23-kilometer route. The Cardinal also noted the Pope wants to keep things simple and to make contact with the poor and the sick of Sri Lanka. EWTN News Nightly's Alan Holdren arrived with the Holy Father in Sri Lanka. He's been with him throughout the day. Alan joins us now from the capital city of Colombo with highlights of the first day of the papal visit. Upon arrival in Sri Lanka this morning, Pope Francis was greeted by 40 elephants and thousands of people, among them the new president of Sri Lanka. He was voted in just last week and there was a peaceful transition of power between one president and another. I was speaking with the Archbishop of Colombo this morning. He said that that fact is a miracle in a nation that's been torn by so much strife in the last 30 to 40 years. The fact that there was a peaceful transition of power uh, was both due to prayer, he said, and also to the fact that Pope Francis was coming. There were so many people in the streets of Colombo all day today that Pope Francis got caught up in greeting them and he actually missed his second appointment. They had to cancel because he was running so far late. And then this afternoon he met with interreligious leaders and he invited them, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus and Christians from all over Sri Lanka to work together to build reconciliation after so many years of conflict. Now, this festive atmosphere that, that we've seen throughout the day here in Sri Lanka will continue tomorrow, of course, with the canonization of Joseph Vaz, called the Apostle of Sri Lanka. Back to you, Brian. All right, Alan is accompanying the Holy Father aboard the papal plane again on this trip. Coming up a little bit later, we give you a look at what it's like to fly with the Pope. <music> President Obama is now proposing new cybersecurity legislation. This comes after yesterday's breach at the Pentagon and the recent hack of Sony Pictures. Chief White House correspondent Suzanne LaFranchi has more from the White House. Brian, the president said cyber attacks pose one of the greatest threats to the U.S. economy and security. He made his remarks at the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center in Arlington, Virginia, this afternoon. While there appears to be some bipartisan support, critics say the president's proposals are nothing new and similar to existing legislation that has been stalled in Congress for years. 
Preventing increasing cyber attacks topped the discussion during the first meeting of the congressional session between party leaders and the president at the White House. It just goes to show how much more work we need to do, both public and private sector, to strengthen our cybersecurity. Obama is calling on Congress to immediately pass his cybersecurity legislation that encourages companies to share threat information with the government, allowing them to qualify for liability protection but comply with privacy restrictions. The push comes after the Twitter and YouTube accounts for U.S. Central Command were taken over by hackers yesterday. Claiming to be terrorists, they posted, ISIS is already here. We are in your PCs in each military base. The hijacked Central Command account read, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, the cyber caliphate continues its cyber jihad. Today, Senator John McCain called the hack little more than a propaganda coup for ISIS. They were not hacking into our most sensitive and secret uh, channels of communication, but you've got to admit, it's embarrassing. Yet cybersecurity experts say the recent cyber attacks need to be taken seriously. What's more concerning is not what they actually stole and posted, it's what they might have stolen and what they might be able to steal in the future. Today, members of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, which is investigating North Korea's cyber attack, were clearly alarmed by the CENTCOM breach. Hacking into our CENTCOM, into our military, ISIS, this is severely disturbing to me. Yesterday's tweets included names and personal addresses of U.S. military officials. They also posted documents related to North Korea and China threatening American soldiers. We are coming. Watch your back. The president will highlight his plan in his State of the Union address next week, and the White House will host a summit on cybersecurity next month at Stanford University. Brian, back to you. All right, thank you, Suzanne, at the White House. And Fred Flights is a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Fred, I'm surprised that CENTCOM has a Twitter page. Do you think that government agencies, large companies, really belong on these social media commercial sites? Brian, it's good to be here, and that is a good question. But I had to point out that the, the world is changing. Social media is the way modern society communicates, especially among the new generation who don't read newspapers. They get their information from Facebook and Twitter. If you were to hire a new intern right out of college, one of the first things they'll ask you is, what are you doing with Twitter to advance your business? This really is the future. But they talked about, you know, the names and addresses of, of members of the military. That's pretty dangerous, isn't it? It's dangerous and it's embarrassing. And, and we have to have an extensive investigation to find out how this happened. Now, I don't think that ISIS hacked CENTCOM's computers, but they got, in, they got this information somewhere. Did they get it from a contractor? Was it a disgruntled employee? Uh, something has to be done because this is, this is very serious. Very personal information was revealed. And ISIS found a way to embarrass the United States and promote its propaganda. And that's something we can't let happen again. So they didn't get into any sensitive information. So is this really more of a public relations problem than it is a security threat? Well, I mean, social media is actually part of CENTCOM's mission to get its, its, its message across, to promote what it has to say to the world and to the American people. It isn't simply a public relations problem or some ancillary aspect to, to CENTCOM's mission. It's becoming an important part of its effort to communicate what it's doing in the region, both to people in the region and to in this country. What do you think we'll see in the way of new security measures after this and the Sony hack? Well, we're going to have, as I say, we're going to have to find out how did this happen. But I think this is a message to the U.S. government that uh, these social media accounts can do a lot of damage if, if, they, if the passwords fall into the hands of hostile powers or people who are, who, are, who are maybe disgruntled employees who want to do some damage to the United States. Steps are going to have to be taken to take this seriously and make sure that there, there are precautions so there's a small number of people who have access to this information and it's carefully controlled. From the Center for Security Policy, Fred Flights, thanks for being back with us tonight. Pleasure to be here. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The bodies of four Jewish hostages killed in the Paris terror attack arrive in Israel today for emotional funerals. Thousands of mourners joined Israeli leaders and the families of the victims of the attack on a Paris kosher supermarket. Relatives of each victim spoke briefly and lit a torch in memory of their loved ones. Those gathered reflected on the deep concern in Israel over the safety of fellow Jews in Europe. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says any French Jews who want to immigrate to Israel are welcome to do so. From the Holy Land to Paris, today marks a day of mourning for last week's terror attack victims. Flowers, candles and other items lined French streets 
forming makeshift memorials. NYPD officers arrived in France paying their respects to the terror attack victims. Twelve people died when two masked gunmen assaulted the Charlie Hebdo newsroom last week. That satirical magazine goes to the presses today for the first time since the terror attack. Three million copies are being printed. That is up from the usual 60,000. Investigators here in Washington are trying to figure out why a subway tunnel filled with heavy smoke just before Monday afternoon's rush hour. One woman died. At least one other person is in critical condition after the terrifying ordeal. A metro subway car was stuck in total darkness with people trapped inside gasping for air. The National Transportation Safety Board is heading the investigation. Officials say electricity arcing between the third rail and cables carrying power to it created the heavy smoke. Eighty-four people are treated at area hospitals. Coming up, drones aren't only for war zones. Businesses and the FAA eye these airborne vehicles controlled from the ground. And what's it like to travel on the papal plane? We go on board when we come back. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening, January 13th. I'm Brian Patrick for EWTN News Nightly, and the FAA is close to releasing proposed rules governing drone flights. Dozens of commercial users are lining up to fly these unmanned vehicles operated from the ground. Katherine Zeltner has the story. Okay, standby for motor checks. These days, you don't have to go far before you find a business that wants to use a drone. Power companies, oil companies, Hollywood, farmers, even Amazon are primed at the starting gate, waiting for the FAA to announce proposed flight rules for commercial use of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. It could be for like a transmission tower like we have about here. You're looking at the insulators, you're looking at the static line on top. For distribution, we could be looking at the cross arms. Right now, commercial use of a drone requires an FAA waiver. San Diego Gas and Electric has such a waiver to fly a drone to inspect power lines. Flying under 200 feet, the quad rotor drone skims along transmission record. lines, relaying images at a cost far less than the $1,200 an hour for a manned helicopter to do the same job. For the FAA, we're still piloting command. Yeah. So it's not like flying a $30 million helicopter anymore, but you're still pilot and commanding, you're still responsible for the safety. A few hundred miles north on a small vineyard in the Napa Valley, unmanned aerial technology is being used for crop fertilization and pest control as a test. So we're understanding how do we use that capability? What's the best use for this technology? What are the limitations? What are the advantages? With the help of GPS, drones can map an entire farm, find pests or dry soil, and relay exact coordinates for attention. Some of the questions are going to be, as we use this new technology, uh, how is that going to change our pest management? The potential for commercial drones is enormous, streamlining costs, cutting risky jobs, and creating innovation. The industry is anxiously awaiting announcement of the proposed FAA rule, a rule that may call for pilot certification and lump all commercial drones into a one-size category. Once the rule is made public, the industry is expected to lobby for changes. Katherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Catherine. Divers have retrieved the second black box from the AirAsia jet that crashed into the Java Sea off Indonesia's coast. Experts should now have the essential information needed to determine why the plane crashed more than two weeks ago. The flight data and cockpit voice recorders provide investigators with an exact timeline of the fated flight. The recorder recovered today will be flown to Indonesia's capital and analyzed with the other black box. The AirAsia plane disappeared from radar carrying 162 people. Fewer than 50 bodies have been recovered so far. The Department of Homeland Security adds several new procedures at airports. New measures include random passenger and luggage searches at the gate. Now this is after passengers have gone through security checkpoints. The increased security comes after Al Qaeda publishes details for making homemade bombs. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be aboard a plane with Pope Francis? Well, tonight, Wyatt Goolsby takes us inside the papal plane on its trip from Rome to Sri Lanka. A little over 70 journalists boarded an Alitalia plane bound for Sri Lanka this weekend. This is like any flight, except that it's papal. The headrests carry the papal coat of arms, and the Alitalia crew hand out luxury brand perfumes. 
A souvenir program shows that the chartered flight will fly over Italy, Albania, Greece, Turkey, Iran, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, and India before reaching Sri Lanka. As is the custom, a telegram of greetings from the Pope, who is the head of state of the Vatican, is sent to the heads of state of these countries just as the plane flies over them. Just 20 minutes into the flight, Father Federico Lombardi, the Vatican spokesperson, announces that Pope Francis will be coming over to greet the journalists, including EWTN News Nightly's Alan Holdren. The Pope's appearance causes quite a stir. Father Lombardi begins by saying the flight is unique because there are Filipino journalists on board, and that is saying something about the expectations in the Philippines. And then Pope Francis talks. Buonasera. Simple words that match the simple man that he is. Francis thanks the journalists for their company, says there is a lot of work, and says that he will greet each one personally. For the 14 Filipino journalists on board, it was the first time to meet the Holy Father. Some asked him to bless items like rosaries. Francis is never known to say no, and he is known to listen to what you say. A special privilege for the journalists on board to meet the Holy Father personally. That's beautiful. Grazie, grazie. They will be very happy. Thank you. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Wyatt. Quite a trip. Well, the Pope's impact extends well beyond his candid interaction with journalists on the plane. Our team in Sri Lanka spoke earlier with the director of Caritas in Colombo, that is the social relief arm of the Catholic Church there. He tells us the Pope is raising awareness across Sri Lankan society about profound Christian values. You always say Happy New Year, Happy Christmas, something, but we don't share what we have, just like Pope Francis says, and accept everybody as they are, and love them and be with them, then only we can make people happy. And Francis definitely doing his share to make people happy if these joyful crowds in Sri Lanka today are any indication. Up next, schoolwork is mostly homework for these kids. Jason Calvey shows us why faith is one reason some families choose to homeschool. And the Bucks down the ducks to be crowned college football's new champion. We're very grateful to have you joining us for EWTN News Nightly on this Tuesday. I'm Brian Patrick. Homeschooling is growing in popularity. The U.S. Department of Education says the numbers have doubled since 1999. Jason Calvey is here now with that story. Brian, there's a lot of reasons why people choose to homeschool, including concerns over the Common Core state standards and the rising price tag of Catholic schools. Shoes are optional at this school. Let's do this. Here, and the hours are a little different. I don't want to go to school every day. Waking up that early is really tiring. But here, it's mostly homework. This is the most dense, so it looks the most bent. A place where the teacher isn't called Mrs. Baldwin, seven, but seven, mom. Mm, she's fine. <laughs> Welcome to the Baldwin Family Homeschool with five students and three graduates. Faith formation would be the number one reason I think that I would do this. And he passes back to the keeper. Passing on the faith is the most important reason why about 16% of parents homeschool. According to a 2012 U.S. Department of Education survey, 25% of parents say the most important reason they choose homeschooling is concerns over school safety, drugs, or peer pressure. Some of the other reasons, not being satisfied with school academics, having a child with special needs, or finances. It was a tough decision, but um, we felt that with four kids, um, just you know, financially it would be better uh, considering the cost of high school and colleges. They're a part of a growing movement with nearly 1.8 million homeschool students in the United States. Learning at my own pace and getting to know everything better. Homeschool kids don't spend all their time at home. Dahl was not only an author, but he fought in World War II as well. Some take classes together or join groups, like this speech club. But homeschooling isn't always recess for the parents. And they were all here and they all needed me all at the same time. You know, it, it was definitely difficult at times. Three graduates of her homeschool are now in college, including Michael, who says he wants to homeschool his future kids. It really helps with the, with the, um, the faith life. Uh, it helps you push yourself. The U.S. Department of Education researchers tell me they won't be collecting the homeschooling data again until next year. We'll see if the growth continues and if things like Common Core lead to a greater surge in homeschooling. Brian?
Jason, thank you. Religious liberty remains a deep concern for many Christians in America. Tonight we look at a pair of recent challenges to the free exercise of faith. Atlanta Fire Chief Kelvin Cochran is fired by the mayor for privately publishing a book about Christian sexual morality and distributing it to his colleagues. Chief Cochran is a devout Christian with a clean professional record. The Atlanta mayor says his dismissal is about Cochran's lack of judgment, not about religious freedom. And here in Washington, city council votes to strip religious liberty protections from schools not wishing to promote homosexuality. Specifically, the D.C. Council last month repealed a 1977 statute making it legal for any educational institution that is affiliated with a religious organization to deny endorsement to people engaged in promoting any homosexual act, lifestyle, orientation, or belief. We have Ryan Anderson specializing in marriage and religious liberty at the Heritage Foundation and co-author of the book, What is Marriage? Man and Woman. Starting with the Atlanta case, many Christians hold traditional values on government positions. Why was this chief fired, do you think? It seems like it's that the mayor disagreed with the viewpoint that he expressed in this book. Um, it looks like the mayor of Atlanta was faced with pressure from various activist groups to fire the fire chief because the fire chief, there were two sentences in the entire book that referenced homosexuality and referenced it casting a negative judgment. And for that, they pressured him to fire him. I read a quote from the mayor. He said, I hired this guy to put out fires. Now he's starting one. Well, it's not really clear that he was starting a fire except for the activists. In 2009, President Obama had appointed the Atlanta fire chief to be the chief fire administrator, uh, administrator for the entire United States. This is a guy with a great record, and there was no evidence that he ever discriminated against anyone and never treated a gay or a lesbian in any uh, negative way. But the activists didn't like the viewpoint that he expressed in his private time in a book that he authored for his Bible study. Ryan, do you think we're going to see more cases like this, or is this an isolated incident? I hope we don't see more, but there's the potential for more of this. I mean, we have to remember that we've seen this in the private sector. We've seen um, them drive out Brendan Eich, the former CEO of Mozilla Firefox, from his position. We've seen the way they treated the Star of Duck Dynasty when he made some remarks about uh, sexuality in the Bible. Uh, we've seen the way that florists and bakers and photographers have been harassed by the government for not wanting to help celebrate same-sex weddings. Um, there's the potential that we could see this happening for government servants in positions of leadership like the fire chief. But we shouldn't. That's the important point to underscore. The government should not be harassing employees based upon their religious views on human sexuality. Let's go now to the D.C. City Council decision uh, before Christmas. Could Catholic and other Christian schools be forced to endorse homosexual actions and activities if this goes through? Yes. I mean, that's the problem with this. They, they revoked uh, an almost 30-year-old religious liberty protection that Congress had passed back in 1989. It's called the Armstrong Amendment. And it protected religious liberty in the uh, District of Columbia for religious schools to not have to promote uh, viewpoints that violate their religious beliefs about human sexuality. And in a unanimous vote back in December, the D.C. City Council voted to strip those religious liberty protections. This is not law yet. What could happen to keep it from becoming law? So it needs to be um, given to the mayor. And then the mayor has a 10-day period to veto the bill. Uh, but since it was passed unanimously, uh, there's a chance that they would then override her veto. Congress then has 30 legislative days. If the mayor signs it into law, Congress has 30 legislative days to review this piece of legislation because the District of Columbia is ultimately under the jurisdiction of Congress. If both houses uh, pass a resolution, um, they can overturn this. It requires President Obama's signature. We'll follow it. Ryan Anderson with the Heritage Foundation. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, the Ohio State University Buckeyes are the first ever winners of the college football national championship based on a playoff format. Ohio State overcame four turnovers, beating Oregon 42-20 last night in Arlington, Texas. The Bucks' defense held the Ducks to their lowest point total of the season, four touchdowns below their average. A lot of credit going to running back Ezekiel Elliott and third-string quarterback Cardell Jones. Well, until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on YouTube. For all of us at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Tonight, we leave you revisiting some of the moments captured by EWTN News Nightly's Alan Holdren on the papal flight and the arrival of Pope Francis in Sri Lanka. Good night and God bless you.